Things from Hollywood. KB Quick Bites is proud to present a WMC Broadcasting Corporation production of Page to Sound, taking those dazzling jewels of the written word and giving your eyes a rest by presenting them in that most exciting of mediums, the radio. Good evening, and thank you for inviting us into your homes. KB Quick Bites, friends of those on the go, is pleased to present this production of Little Women, starring those old favorites of your ears, Peyton Gowder, Erica Friesen, Aidan Bach, Jean Bergen, Renee Zacharias, who are joined by Caitlin King, Eric Duick, Rebecca Lowen, Robin Bach, Lena Claussen, Jane Cote Paris, and WMC's own William Krovatz. And now, to bring you into this beloved story, here's your evening's host. Little Women is one of the most enjoyable stories ever written. It has all the endearing qualities that make for real drama, laughter, romance, and tears. And never has the story been presented more expertly or with greater artistry than in what you are about to hear. Little Women is the story of the March sisters and their romances, four girls whose loves and ambitions are completely different but who are bound together by happy family ties, a story beloved by generations. You know every day we receive letters from busy folks like yourselves struggling to eat right in this age of go, go, go. KB Quick Bites provides you with luxury and convenience without sacrificing nutritional value or taste. And now, Little Women. We begin with four sisters, Amy, Joe, Beth, and Meg. We shall start our story during that winter of 1864, when their father was still away at war. What a miserable Christmas, they all thought. But how happy a Christmas it really was. Well, at least we have a Christmas tree, Amy, and I think it's beautiful. Christmas won't be Christmas, Beth. Not without presents. Oh, it's dreadful to be poor. I especially feel it, because I'm the eldest, and I can remember when we used to be rich. We're better off than a lot of people, Meg. Orphans, for instance. We have father and Marmy and each other. But we haven't got father, Beth, and probably won't have him for a long time. But Joe, the men in the army are having such a terrible winter. Marmy's right. We have to make sacrifices. Only I'm tired of making over these same dresses year after year. Well, I don't think any of you suffer as I do. You do not need to go to school with impertinent girls who label your father just because he's poor. Oh, Amy, if you mean libel, then say so. And stop talking about labels as if Papa were a pickle bottle. <laughs> well, you needn't be so satirical about it, Joe. It's proper to use good words and approve one's vocabulary. Vocabulary? Christopher Columbus! Joe! Don't use slang words. Oh, I just detest rude, unladylike young ladies. And I hate affected snips. Birds in their little nests agree. Oh, I'll never get over my disappointment at not being a boy. Look at me, dying, simply dying, to go and fight at father's side. And here I am, sitting and knitting, like a pokey old woman. Poor Joe. Oh, thank you, Miss Beth. But I don't need any pity. Because someday I'll be a famous writer and make my fortune. Oh, not that I'll forget about my sisters. You'll all ride around in fine carriages. And you, my Beth, you will have a new piano. And you, Meg, you'll have ten dozen dresses and satin slippers and red-headed boys to dance with. I shall like that. Thank you. So there's no use fretting now. I'll get famous just as soon as I can. Meanwhile, let's rehearse the play. Meanwhile, it's time for tea. Come, girls, help me with the tray. Oh, don't we have any coffee anymore, Hannah? Coffee is scarce and dear, and it seems to me you'd be... Oh. What is it, Hannah? Someone's looking in this room. <gasps> what? Keep away from the window. But, Hannah, who is it? That Lawrence boy. Where? Where is he? Next door in the Lawrence house, where he belongs, only he does not belong in their parlor window, staring into our parlor window. But what, Lawrence boy? Mr. Lawrence's grandson, of course. <laughs> I didn't know the old fusspot had a grandson. Well, he just came home. First, he ran away from college. <gasps> oh my goodness, that's the bravest thing I've ever heard of! And when they found him, there he was, wounded in an army hospital, 
He had lied with his age and enlisted. How perfectly splendid! I should like to do the same. <sighs> Joe, what are you doing? Well, if he can look out of his window at us, I can look out of ours at him. <gasps> Josephine Mark! Oh, he's still there! Oh, gee, I'm glad he's a boy. I certainly would like to know a boy for a change and have a little fun. Oh, how can you say such things? Hmm, I wonder how I could get to know him. <laughs> Yoo-hoo! Oh, Joe, you're disgracing us. Hello. Why, that dreadful boy, he's waving at me. When the girl's mommy came home late that afternoon from helping poor Mrs. Hummel and her children in the village, the house was a flutter of activity. Amy took Marmy's winter clothes and Beth brought her chair to the fire and Joe and Meg hastily cleared away their props from their grand rehearsal. And Marmy, wait until you hear Meg's big news. News, Meg? What news, dear? Well, I saw Miss King about the position, Marmy, and, and she's going to take me four dollars a week. Meg, I'm so proud of you. Oh, they have a beautiful house, Marmy, and the children are sweet. I, I won't mind working for them at all. Oh, was there any mail in the village, Marmy? A letter from Father? You don't think he'd forget to write us all at Christmas, do you? Amy, dear, the letter's in my bag. A letter, a letter from Father. He sent you all a little Christmas message. How do you do? Aunt March. A, oh, a oh, Merry, Merry Christmas, Christmas, Aunt March. March. How nice of you to come. Yes, it was nice of me to come. Uh, here, a Christmas remembrance for each of you. For Meg. Thank you, Aunt March. Josephine. Thank you, Aunt March. For Beth. Thank you, Aunt March. And for Amy. Thank you, Aunt March. <laughs> when I was a girl, my aunts didn't have to come to me. Oh, we plan to visit you tomorrow, Aunt March. One never knows if there will be a tomorrow. Well, have you heard from that foolish father of yours, waltzing away to war and leaving others to care for his family? We're very proud of father, Aunt March, and there's nobody looking out for us. Tidy, tidy. If your father had listened to me, young ladies, you'd be better off today. I begged him not to invest his money with that swindler. If I told him once, I told him, Forgive yes. Forgive me, Aunt March, but, but that was years ago and has nothing to do with now. Besides, it was our money that got lost, not yours. Uh, don't be impertinent, miss. Uh, it's a waste of my time to talk. Nobody listens to me anyhow. Merry Christmas. Merry, Merry Christmas, Christmas, Aunt March. Uh, Aunt March, I'll walk out to your sleigh with you. And catch your death of a cold while you're about it. Aunt March, you still want me to work for you, don't you? A fine time to ask me. Well, I'd like to be your companion. A companion should be companionable, young woman. I will be, I promise. I am willing to bury the hatchet. You are, are you? Come over after the holidays. And bring an apron. All right, thank you, Auntie. A Merry Christmas! For all her scolding, Aunt March had given each of the girls a new shining silver dollar. Supper would have to wait that night as they dashed off to the village store. By evening, there were presents wrapped for each girl by her own hand nestled under the tree. Oh, come sit down, Joe. Marmy was just about to finish Father's letter. And give my girls my love and a kiss. Tell them I think of them by day, pray for them by night, and find my best comfort in their affection at all times. I know they will remember to be loving children to you, will work diligently so that these hard times need not be wasted, and that when I return I may be fonder and prouder of ever of my, my little women. How sad is... Mrs. How March, ma'am? Yes, Hannah? A message from poor Mrs. Hummer, ma'am. She wants to know how soon you can come. Right away. Amy, get my boots, dear. My wraps? Joe. Good night, my children. Good, Good night, night Marmy. Marmy. Don't wait up for me. I may be late. Your bag, ma'am. And do you be careful. Good night, Good night Merry, Merry Christmas. Christmas! A fine Christmas Eve. Papa far away and Marmy taking care of sick people. And our presents, they look so lonesome under the tree. And there's, there's nothing for fa Marmy. Nothing. And she needs a new pair of slippers. Well, I'm the man in the family while Papa's away, so I'll supply the slippers. Uh, but how? All our money spent. Well, I bought a book. I'll take it back. But I thought of the slippers first, Joe. So you did, Beth. Uh, well then, I'll buy her army shoes, the very best to be had. 
and I'll get her a nice pair of gloves. Pink ones. A and a little bottle of cologne for me. Both Marmy and I just love cologne. Oh, but but won't the stores be closed? Who cares? Uh, come on, me hearties. We'll storm the Citadel. It was long past midnight when Marmy returned. All four girls huddled at the top of the stairs when they heard her come in, waiting eagerly for her to notice the four new presents sitting near the tree. But, but why is she crying? I can hear Marmy and she's crying. Doesn't she like our presents? Come on now, back to bed before she sees us. Why is she crying, Meg? Because she loves us, little Beth, and love and tears live close together. Come on now. Christopher Columbus, what a breakfast! Look, kidney pie and sausage! Popovers and, <gasps> and coffee! And everything! Good morning, girls. Merry Christmas. Merry, Merry Christmas, Christmas, Hannah! Hannah, you are amazing! Oh, I can remember when I served a breakfast like this every day. We must have been enormously rich! Well, kindly pass the popovers, Meg! Now, wait for Marmy, Amy. Oh, your mom's took breakfast and gone. She said she'll meet you all in church. Gone? Back to the Hummels. The baby finally came, early this morning. Another baby? One after another. Six children, half frozen, huddled in one bed to try and keep warm, she said. Your mom gone and took her breakfast to them. I, I'm not hungry either. Oh, Beth. I'm not hungry. But people are starving everywhere every day. If you're going to let that worry you, you'll, you'll never eat at all. I try not to think about it. Those people are far away, Meg, and we don't know them. But the Hummels are near, and we do know them. <gasps> you! You're not thinking of giving our breakfast to the Hummels! Yes, we are, aren't we, Joe? Oh, no! You, you couldn't think of a thing like that! No! Poor, hungry Amy. A few minutes later, the girls were out the door, loaded with food for the Hummels. As they walked down the road to the village, their path took them right past the neighboring Lawrence mansion. Oh, Meg, look! There are some people coming up the driveway. Mr. Lawrence's grandson and someone else. Mind your step, Amy. You'll drop the pie. Aren't you rather loaded down, madame? May I help you? Oh, oh, no thank you, sir. Josephine, must you lag so? Just a minute! You're his grandson, aren't you? Mr. Lawrence's. Why, yes. Yes, I am. I'm Theodore Lawrence. That man waiting for me there is my friend, John Brooke. I'm Joe March, and I'd like you to meet my sisters, only I guess they're too far up the road. Oh, what a pity. Oh, we all know about you, you know. About how you ran away to join the army. Oh, and I'd have done the same in your place. It is splendid, I think. Simply splendid. Oh, well, I'm pleased, Miss March. Simply pleased. Josephine, come on! Well, goodbye. Goodbye, Miss March. Joe, really, I must say. Oh, really? Oh, fiddlesticks. What will they think, stopping to talk when we haven't met them properly? Well, you weren't very friendly. You didn't even say, how do you do? I didn't like the way that man stared at me. What man? Oh, uh, Mr. Brook? I didn't notice. Well, I did, and he's still looking. Who? Well, Mr. Brook, don't look back. Oh, poo. Bye! <laughs> Now who would have thought that a Christmas breakfast would change so many lives? The Hummels were fed and grateful, and the connection between the Lawrence and March homes could only grow. The next day, Joe was outside shoveling snow. Hello! Hello! Hustle yourself out here and help me! I can't. I have the Quincy. Oh, what a shame! Oh, it isn't contagious. I can have visitors, but I don't know anyone, though. Well, you know me! Well, would you care to come over and keep me company? Well, I, I'll speak to my mother, Mr. Lawrence. You may expect me, though. Thank you. Well, here I am, Mr. Lawrence. 
and I brought you some blamange. It's soft and will slide down easily. Quincy, huh? Got some flannel around your throat? Oh, yes, yes. You see, and thanks for the blamage. Well, I've come to entertain you. I'll read aloud and you can listen. I do love to read aloud. Well, I'd rather just talk, if you don't mind. Uh, won't you sit by the fire? Oh, thank you. I love to talk, too. I always... <gasps> Christopher Columbus! What's the matter? Uh, well, this room! What richness! Oh, I call this splendor. That's what I call it, splendor. Mr. Theodore Lawrence, you should be the happiest creature alive. Well, it's just a room to me. Some tea, Miss March. How many lumps? Uh, one, please. Uh, three. Now do tell me all about yourself. Oh, of course, I know all about your school and the army, but before that, what? Well, I used to live in Europe with my parents before they died. Oh, I'm sorry. Um, I'm going to Europe too, you know. Oh, really? When? Oh, well, I don't know exactly. You see, my Aunt March, I've decided to work for her as a companion. Oh, and what a nervous, fidgety soul she is, too. Well, anyway, my Aunt March has rheumatism, and the doctor thought that baths... Uh, not that she hasn't got a bath. She has a very nice bath. Mm -hmm. Did you have any baths while you were there, Mr. Lawrence? I mean, for your rheumatism. I haven't got rheumatism. Oh, well, <laughs> neither have I. But you see, I figured that baths wouldn't do me any harm. That is to say, while I was there, because I've always wanted to go to Europe. Uh, well, not for the baths, of course, not at all, but for my writing. Mm -hmm. It's so good for writers. You see, Aunt March? Oh, but you don't know Aunt March. Uh, what were you going to say, Mr. Lawrence? Well, it was so long ago, I've forgotten. But I'm not Mr. Lawrence. I'm Lori. Oh, well, Lori... Um, how are you getting along with your father, Laurie? Oh, fine, fine. Once I got used to him, isn't he a holy terror? <laughs> you should see my Aunt March. Oh, she's got the best of all of us, even Meg. She's the oldest. Oh, she is. You know, John and I were wondering... Oh, why should he wonder? Well, he, uh, seems quite taken by your sister's beauty, and, well, he wondered if there was anybody that is anybody she liked... Did he ask you to find out? No, no, no. I was just... Well, you may tell Mr. Brooke that we don't like anybody in our house. Uh, no, that, that is, we like a great many people, but we don't like young men. Uh, no, we, we like young men, but we don't like young men who wonder about who else we like. Oh. And, and, and Meg is too young and too fine and far, far too clever to bother about who wonders about it. It's ridiculous. I beg your pardon, Miss Marjorie. Yes? Uh, you're on fire. What? Your dress in the rear. Oh, uh, how clumsy. Here, I, let me help you. Uh, well, put it out. Don't just stand there. Oh, I'm sorry. I hope I didn't hurt you. Oh, well, that's the second dress I've scorched this week. You see, I like to toast myself and I get too close. I think I'd better go home. Oh, please don't go. It's dull as tombs in here. Is that why you stand at your window looking at us? You might come over to visit. Well, my grandfather mightn't approve. He'd say I was imposing, but in spite of that... Oh, Bilge! Oh, I know his face frightens half of Concord, but it doesn't frighten me. Of course, every time I've ever seen him, he's been barking at something. Nevertheless, I, I rather like him. Well, that's something, isn't it? Oh, Mr. Lawrence. Thank you, madam. My face frightens half of Concord, does it? Yes, sir. Frankly, it does. Uh, you understand, I don't think you mean to frighten them, but your face is... Wh uh, wh you ask me, sir, and yes, I do think so. And I bark, do I? I've heard you bark, yes, sir. Perhaps you don't bark all the time, but you do bark, yes, sir. And with all that, you rather like me, do you? Yes, I do. I really do, in spite of everything. And I like you. Have a cup of tea. Oh, thank you. I had one. I was just going. No, not so fast, young lady. I have something to ask you. Yes, sir? Unless you have already asked her, Laurie. <laughs> oh, no, sir. I've had difficulty saying much of anything, sir. Ah, yes. Young lady, on Saturday night there will be a cotillion of sorts in this house. We shall be happy if you and your sisters attend. A cotillion? Here! Well, will you attend? Will we? Oh, I mean, I shall ask my mother, Mr. Lawrence. It's very grateful of you, sir. I'll go home and ask her right now. A cotillion, Christopher Columbus! You know, Laurie, I wonder if that young woman ever walks. Christopher Columbus, sir. I wonder, too.
in a few moments, we'll bring you Act 2 of Little Women. But as we take a moment to reflect on the beautiful hearts of the March sisters, we'd like to get you up to snuff on the latest Hollywood gossip. Here's our very own Arthur Bailey with that most tenacious of reporters, Lindsay Collins. Well, hey there, Lindsay. What scoop have you got for us today? Well, Arthur, the darling of musical movies will soon be seen in a new one. Betty Grable, 20th Century Fox's Wabash Avenue. An event that will make the fans happy? You know, Betty's always delightful in a singing and dancing part. Mm Mm-hmm. She plays an 1890s cabaret performer in love with Victor Mature, the breezy lad who helps her to stardom. And Phil Harris does himself proud in his first dramatic part as the Diamond in the Rough cafe owner. You know, some of the ensemble scenes are way beyond what the 90s could have performed in lavishness, and the cast wears some fabulous costumes. And the Technicolor captures them all in stunning detail. Indeed, it does, Arthur. Never before have the motion pictures sparkled so. Just like the light in your dining room shining off a freshly made tuna and Brussels sprout jello salad from KB Quick Bites. It's amazing how versatile KB Quick Bites really is. Ah, yes. I myself like to make the orange chicken. Just open a tin of KB's whole canned chicken, grab a package of orange jello mix, and mix together. A half hour in the fridge is all it takes to make a meal your family will beg for. For a healthier option, mix in some mashed peas or stewed spinach. For me, nothing can beat the convenience and taste of KB's hot dog surprise. The jello comes pre-mixed with ketchup and mustard. Just add KB's frankfurters and some fresh chopped onion. You won't believe it isn't fresh off the grill. Ah, my tummy rumbles just hearing about it. And now, Act 2 of Little Women. A party. An invitation to a party in the richest, most elegant home in Concord. No wonder our March girls were so excited when Saturday night finally arrived. You look just lovely, Meg, dear. Thank you, Marmy. I'm so looking forward to tonight. Though, I think Amy and I are the only ones who really want to go. Where is Amy? Oh, she's painting Joe's dress, Marmy. She's what? Joe's done it again. Stood too close to the fire. Her best dress, too. Oh, no. Beth and I patched it for her, and now Amy's painting the patch to sort of blend it. Watercolors. Oh, that's splendid, Amy. Splendid. It's right as rain now. Uh, But it still shows, Joe. I don't know what you're going to do. Oh, that's very simple. I shall spend the evening sitting in chairs with Beth. Do I really have to go? Do I, Marmy? There'll be all those people. But it would hurt their feelings if you stayed at home. And besides, little Beth, you must not learn not to be so afraid of people. Well, you at least look most attractive, Beth. But look at me. My shoes are too tight. I have 19 hairpins sticking in my head and a patch on my back. And I feel dreadful. Joe! Don't you have your white gloves? Oh, all right. Oh, how I hate to be elegant. Well, good night, Marmy. Good night, my dears. Good Good night, night, Marmy. Now, don't eat too much, Amy, and wait until you've asked. (sighs) Marmy, you think I were a child. Just tell Joe not to stride around and swear. She'll disgrace us. I shall be prim as a dish. Come on, my dears, let's be elegant or die. I'm glad we found the spot, Amy. Nobody can see us behind all these potted palms. A palm in a pot is a mark of elegance. Can you see Meg? Oh, yes. She's still dancing with Lori's friend. (laughs) Mr. Brooke? Uh Uh-huh. You know, my dear Beth, I do believe our Meg is stricken. I think so, too. Dancing makes anybody dizzy. Uh, Oh, no. I... I don't, I don't mean that. <gasps> Amy, look. Oh, just look at that piano over there. Wow, isn't it just perfectly absolute? Why, why, it's bigger than our kitchen. Who's that? Who's that behind the palm? Oh, don't let him see me, Amy. Why aren't you dancing, Miss Amy? Ugh, mother thinks I'm too young, Mr. Lawrence. Besides, I'd rather mingle with my little sister here than mingle with the crowd. She has an informality, Mr. Lawrence. Oh? She's shy. Oh, I see. But if it weren't for that, she'd be simply fastidious. She's a real artist, you know, plays the piano beautifully. Well, she should 
come over here and play sometime. Oh, she'd never do that. She doesn't play for people, just herself. But I wasn't going to listen to her. It's just that that piano is going to ruin for want of use. Well, if no one cares to come, never mind. Oh, oh no, wait. Someone does care. Very much. Oh, I didn't realize you heard what I was saying. I heard, sir. I am Beth, and I'll come in if no one will hear me and be disturbed. Not a soul, my dear. Not a soul. And please tell your mother that I think all her daughters are simply fastidious. <gasps> oh, Beth, isn't he just a perfectionary? Why, I think... <gasps> Amy, somebody's coming. Let's hide again. Ugh, is that stuck-up Mrs. Gardner and her daughter? Don't move. Did you see him, Sally? Theodore Lawrence still with that impudent Miss March. Well, it's very obvious she set her cap for him. Well, what can you expect, Mother? One of them has to marry for money since they've none of their own. Well, Mr. Lawrence will have something to say about this. I'm sure he has other plans for the boy. Of course, it would be a triumph for, for Miss March. I must say, she's managing the affair quite well. <gasps> Amy! Amy, did you hear what they... Oh, Amy! Now, this is the third dance, Joe. How can a girl sit so much? Well, if you must know, see for yourself. There, I'm patched. Oh, so you did it again, huh? Too close to the fire. You know, life will be far less complicated for me when the warm weather comes. Joe! Joe! Something awful's happened! Amy! Uh, well, what is it? Oh, I can't tell you now, not in front of... him. <sighs> Beth wants to go home. She's had a dreadful shock, and... And I think I want to go home, too. Where's Meg, Lori? Still with John Brooke, of course. Lori, would you please fetch her? Of course. I don't understand, Joe, coming home from the party so early. Well, I'm glad you had a nice time. Oh, yes, Marmy, it was splendid. Simply splendid. Uh, Marmy. Yes, dear? Um... You don't have any plans for us, do you? Plans? Well, you know, like like wanting us to marry rich men or something. Why, yes, Joe. I have a great many plans. I want you all to be beautiful, accomplished, and good. Of course I'd like to see you marry rich men, if you loved them. But I'd rather see you as the happy wives of poor men, or even respectable old maids, than queens on thrones without peace or self-respect. Oh, I'm never going to get married. Never. Oh, you aren't, my Joe. <laughs> now go to bed, sweetheart. Go to bed. One reason why Joe was so sure she'd never get married was because she wanted to be a writer far more than a wife. Joe never stopped writing. It left her very little spare time, even for Lori. Lori's here, Joe. He said that you said that Aunt March said that you didn't have to go to her house today. Well, Beth, just send him away. He says he's just going to wait until you come down. Oh, I wish he'd realize I haven't time for his nonsense. And uh, what's in the package? Slippers. I made them. Who for? A gentleman. A gentle? What's the matter with everybody in this family? Oh, but, but this is an old gentleman. They're for Lori's grandfather. He's been so kind about letting me play on that lovely piano. And in all the weeks I've been going there, I haven't even seen him. Well, go ahead then. Give him the slippers. If your story's done, Joe, can I read it? Nope, not now. But you can keep your fingers crossed, and maybe someday you'll see it in print. I'm taking it to the publishers this morning. Now you run along. Joe, but what'll I tell Lori? Oh, tell him I went up in smoke. So Joe went into town, but what she didn't know was that Lori went into town too, and he waited for her in front of the publishing office. That's not very good manners, Mr. Lawrence, following me. What about your manners? Trying to avoid me all the time? What were you doing in there? What I was doing is a secret. All right, keep your secret, only I've got one too. Oh, something plummy. Something very plummy. Now, tell me yours, and I'll tell you mine. All right. Here. A bank draft? Well, read it. Pay to Josephine March for the sum of one dollar. 
For what? Turn it over! In full payment for her story entitled, The Phantom Hand. Well? One dollar? Oh, well, maybe it isn't much, but someday I'll get as as much as ten dollars. Yo, I don't understand you. Cooping yourself up, missing a lot of fun, working, and for what? One measly little dollar? It isn't the dollar. At least, that's not all of it. It's, well, it... It'll be read in print, and I wrote every word, and people will read it. People I've never even seen. Anyway, what's your secret? Well, you remember that glove that Meg couldn't find? Meg's glove? What about it? Well, I know where it is. In somebody's pocket. John Brooks. That's very romantic, isn't it? No, it's horrid! Of all the sickly, sentimental rubbish, I- I'm disgusted. And I'm certainly glad Meg doesn't know. She'd be furious. I believe she's very fond of John. She's perfectly happy with the way things are. And you'd better tell Mr. Brooke to keep away from us, or I'll let him know just what I think of him. I'm trying to break up my family. Oh, just wait till someone falls in love with you, Joe. I'd like to see anyone try it. Joe, Joe, wait, Joe! Joe, what are you doing? John, Mr. Brooke was barely down the stairs, and you nearly bowled him over. Well, can't a member of this family even come into the house? Oh, I've never been so embarrassed in my life. Oh, Joe, when are you going to stop your rude, romping ways? Not till I'm old and stiff and need a crutch. Look at you, no hairpins, no comb, running down a public road. I wish I was a horse! Falling in love, that's what you are, Meg. And Amy's not much better either, always primping and showing off. Beth's the only one I can depend on. Where is she? She's in the parlor. Oh, oh, we just had a big surprise. What kind of surprise? Mr. Lawrence sent her a present, and it took six men to carry it over. His piano. Piano? Yes, he's given it to Beth. For me, Joe, he, he gave it to me, Mr. Lawrence. But his note, darling... You haven't even opened up the note he sent. Well, read it, Beth. I I can't. W- will you read it, Joe? <clears throat> Miss Elizabeth March. Dear Madame. Oh, how elegant. I have had many pairs of slippers in my life, but never any that suited me so well as yours. I like to pay my debts, so I know you will allow the old gentleman to send you something which once belonged to the little daughter he lost. Aww. I remain your grateful friend and humble servant, James Lawrence. Aren't you going to play the piano, dearly? Not now. I, I have to go and thank him. Look at her, Marmy. Our little scared rabbit going all by herself. The piano's turned her head. She'd never go, not in her right mind. A young lady to see you, Mr. Lawrence. Miss Beth March, the pianist. Well, show her in, show her in. Good afternoon. Well, are you here to see me? Yes, sir. Now look at your chin. It's all quivering, but why? I... I came to thank you, sir. I came to thank you. The piano... Oh, my dear girl. It was yours as soon as you had first played it. Here, Meg. Take more of these bandages to Mrs. March. Heaven knows how many she'll need up there. Thank you, Hannah. Have you seen Marmy's blue shell? No. It's father's girl. favorite. Now, girl, your head's been turned by thoughts of romance. Don't fuss. It's clear as day the way that Mr. Brooke and you carrying on these last months. But it ain't blue your father needs. It's your mom. Plain and simple. Miss Josephine March to see you, ma'am. Well, Josephine. So, your father's in the hospital, eh? Wounded? Not surprising. Marmy's packing now, Aunt March, and 
she asked, she sent me to ask for your help. She needs $25 for the fare to the hospital to care for him. Oh, she does, Miss Jo. I begged your father not to go in the first place. But no one listens to me, not until they get into trouble. Oh, Aunt March, what's the use of all that now? The train leaves in two hours. Always interrupting me, but you'll listen this time. No, I won't. I only came here because Marmy says she's not too proud to beg for father. Well, I am. I'm too proud to beg for anyone. I'd rather sweep the streets than ever come to you again. Stubborn, obstinate, rude. Uh, Josephine, come back here. Come back! So, you had another argument with Aunt March? Yes, Marmy. Well, that's funny. She didn't say anything about it when she was here just now. Aunt March was here. Why, yes, dear. She brought me the money. Oh, no. And where have you been? Lori's been looking all over for you, Joe. Oh, I lost my temper. So, I decided to get some money on my own. Here, Marmy. But, but where'd you get it? How? Well, look. <gasps> oh, Joe. Joe, your hair. Your beautiful hair. Oh, my poor Joe. Amy, Amy, look! Joe's cut her hair off and sold it! Well, it doesn't affect the fate of the nation, so don't start wailing. Oh, so you've come home. I've been like Christopher Columbus! You look like a porcupine! Really? I feel deliciously light and cool. Your hair will go back, Joe. It'll be just as lovely as ever. But you will never look more beautiful than you are now. Marmy, your, your train. I'll be glad to drive you to the station, Miss March. Thank you, Lori. Goodbye, my darlings. God bless and keep us all. Never had the house been as empty as now. Marmy gone to care for their father, wounded in a hospital. No one could say how badly. And then came the worst disaster of all. Come on in, Beth. Lunch is all ready. How are the Hummels, dear? Did you help them just like Marmy said? Don't come near me. Beth? What is it? The baby. The Hummel's baby. The baby's dead, Joe. Baby's dead. Oh, no. I tried to warm her feet, but she was so cold and lay so still that I knew she was dead. And then the doctor came and he said it was scarlet fever. Oh, Beth. Look at her. Look at her face. No. Keep away from me. I... I feel funny, I... <sighs> I'll put her to bed, Joe. Run for Dr. Barnes. We pause now for station identification. This is WMC, broadcasting to you from our studio on the banks of the Assiniboian. moment we will bring you act three of little woman but first i'm sure you'll be pleased to meet one of the rising stars of motion pictures barbara b our intrepid on-scene reporter lindsay collins has invited her in for an exclusive chat with herself and your favorite host william Crovatz. well hello there barbara people may not know your name yet but i'm sure they will after seeing your new film a parisian in america Starring opposite that dazzling Twinkle Toes Gene Kelly. Thank you for having me, Lindsay. Yes, it was great fun dancing with such a partner as Gene. Now, Barbara, do I have it right that you didn't dance much before being cast? Right you are, William. It was quite the challenge. I had two weeks to learn the Lindy Hop, Big Apple, and Trunky Do. Now you're out there cutting a rug with the best of them, dancing circles around those hepcats in their zoot suits. I'm not sure about that, Lindsay, but I am sure I only have the energy to keep up with all those dancers because of the nutritious and delicious meals provided by KB Quick Bites. Yes, KB Quick Bites knows that time is tight for everyone these days, so they've created their own line of KB's Quickest. Open in heat, convenience food, ready for those on the go. When I'm rehearsing 12 hours a day and need a little pick-me-up, I just open a can of cream chip beef, spoon it onto some bread, and I'm ready to be back at it. For my bread, I choose KB's full meal loaf. Cheese, olives, onions, pickles, mayonnaise, all nestled in the finest bologna. Just slice and put between bread and you have everything the body needs. Mmm, 
Mm-hmm, certainly two of my favorites. And now, Act 3 of WMC's Little Women. Beth's struggle with scarlet fever would be remembered by the March girls as the darkest days of their lives. But their prayers were answered and their little sister was spared. Mommy returned home to care for her, and then came the glorious day when the girl's beloved papa walked through their door. He was thin and worn and weak, but home again, and all was as it should be. Well, Meg, I guess the March family is all together once again. Oh, I call that splendid. I do, really. If only you didn't. If uh, only I didn't what? Meg, are you expecting that man to call? Man? Well, if you mean John Brooke, Joe... Well, I hope you don't think you're in love with him, because I can tell that you are not. I'm not? Nope. You see, Meg, I'm a writer, and so I know. You have none of the symptoms. Your appetite's fine, you sleep like a log, and you don't mope in corners. Therefore, you are not in love. Therefore, do not go and marry that man. I don't attend to go and marry any man. You don't? Hurrah for you! But what will you say to him when he comes begging for your hand? Well, I should say thank you, Mr. Brooke, quite calmly and decisively. Thank you, Mr. Brooke. Let us be good friends, but nothing more. Good! Hand him the mitten, Meg, and then maybe things around here will be the way they were when... Oh, no. Oh, no what? Joe, he's here. Look! The veranda! You're in luck! You can tell him off right now! Oh, if only I could see his face when you do! Hello, John. I really do think... Why Aunt March? Margaret, I require your presence immediately. I'm, I'm sure this man can spare you. Oh, well, certainly, Aunt March. If... John, I'll return in a moment. Well, what I'll... was he doing? Proposing to you, wasn't he? Oh, please, Aunt March, he'll hear you. Well, let me tell you, miss, except that rook, crook, or brook... And not one penny of my money goes to you. I shall marry whom I please, Aunt March. And and I don't care anything about your money. It is your duty, Miss Independence, to marry a rich man and help your family. You may be perfectly sure that Fortune Chaser knows you have a rich aunt. And that is why he wants to marry you. How dare you say such a thing? Why... Why, my John would no more marry for money than, than I would. <laughs> Do as you please. But the day you marry him, consider yourself disinherited. <laughs> now you've even made me forget why I came here in the first place. John and Meg were married three months later, and Aunt March did attend. There was a reception afterwards at the Lawrence home, and as the dancing began, Joe stole away from the crowd. No one was surprised to see Lori going after her, and more than one guest remarked that another wedding would not be far distant. Oh, don't feel too badly, Joe. She's still your sister, and there isn't a finer man in the world than John Brooke. She married him after all of her promises. Well, you've still got me, Joe. I know I'm not good for much, but I'll stand with you all the days of my life. You don't know what a comfort you are to me, Lori. Joe, will you listen to what I have to tell you? No, Lori, don't say it. Oh, but I will, and you must hear me. It's no use, Joe. Please. I've loved you ever since I've known you. I couldn't help it. I've tried to show you, but you wouldn't let me, and now I'm going to make you give me an answer. I never wanted you to care for me so. I've tried to keep it from you when I could. And I only loved you more for it. Oh, I know I'm not good enough for you, Joe, but if you love me, you can make me anything you like. Lori, I wouldn't change you. You should marry a lovely, accomplished girl who adores you. Someone, someone who would give you the sort of life you really want. I wouldn't. We'd quarrel, Laurie, and... Oh, no, no, no. We wouldn't. We have, you know. And everything would be horrid. Oh, it would be heaven, Joe. I just can't go on without you. I'm so sorry, Laurie. So desperately sorry, but I can't say I love you when I don't. Really and truly, Joe? Really and truly, Laurie. I don't think I'll ever marry. Oh, yes, you will. You'll meet some good-for-nothing fool and work and live and die for him. I know you will, because it's, it's just your way. 
and I'm to stand by and see it all happen. Well, I'll be hanged if I will. Lori, where are you going? To the devil! Lori! The months went by, and Lori and Joe scarcely saw each other. And then, throughout March, Joe heard of a position in New York, a good family in need of a governess. Oh, I've always wanted to go to New York, Marmy. Why, they have the finest libraries and theaters there. And, and in my spare time, I can write. Let me talk it over with Father, my darling. I've already asked him. He says it's, it's up to you. It might be good for you, Joe. Oh, it would. And I won't stay forever, a year, maybe. And when I come back, why, everything will be just the same as it used to be. I have no little ones anymore, Joe. Well, you have Beth, Marmy. And Amy. Yes, Joe. Yes, of course. So Joe left Concord. She wrote home regularly, and always an inquiry about Lori, and after a while, always a passing mention of a tutor in the same household, a foreigner named Professor Bear. March. Oh, please don't stop, Professor Bear. It's so beautiful. Thank you very much. Oh, what is that song? I've heard you play it before. It's called Nur wer die Sehnsucht kennt. Do you understand German, Miss March? No, no, I don't. The, wor the words are by a famous writer, Goethe. I will try to say them for you in English. Let's see now. Only who knows what longing is can know what I suffer. Alone and parted, far from joy and gladness, my senses fail, a burning fire devours me. Oh, if only I could write something like that. Something that would set other hearts on fire. You truly like to write, do you not? Oh, it's my life, Professor Bear. Sometime you will show me what you have written. Oh, yes, and I've just sold another story. It's, it's in the weekly volcano. Oh, it's a wonderful one about... Well, if you'd really like to read the it. The Weekly Volcano? It's a magazine, and it's the best story I've ever done. Uh, how happy you look, Miss March. I'm so glad for you. I am happy. And you have not missed your home so much lately, or your, your old friends? No. No, I haven't. And you are most responsible for that. Ah, thank you, my friend. Oh, showing me this wonderful, exciting city, the museums, the theaters. I will tell you something, Miss March. There is no greater pleasure than to hear or see something beautiful with someone, someone Excuse who... Excuse me, Miss March? Uh, yes, Paula. You have visitors, Miss. Your aunt and your sister. Oh, won't it be wonderful, Joe? I'm going to study my painting with the great masters and, and just think of how beautifully my French shall sound while I return. Of course, I know I promised to take you to Europe, Joe. But then Amy and I just got along famously, and I never did get along with you, now did I? Oh, it, it's all right, Aunt March. Oh, and Amy, dear, I'm so happy for you. Uh, now tell me, how's the family? Oh, they're all fine, Joe. Uh, except Beth. She hasn't been well since she was so sick that time. Beth. Oh, she must get well, she must. And you do know that Meg is expecting. Dreadful, isn't it? <laughs> no, Auntie. It's wonderful. And, um, how's Laurie? Laurie? Well, didn't you see him when he was here? Here? In New York? Mm-hmm. Just two weeks ago. He and Mr. Lawrence are on their way to England. And he didn't come to see me? Well, can you blame him after the way you trotted off? I do always say you must learn to control your flighty temper, but no one listens to me. He didn't even try to see me. Yes, mi yes, Miss March. I have read every one, all of your stories. Thank you for lending them to me. Well, Professor Bear? I must be honest, my friend. I was disappointed. Oh. Why do you write such... such artificial characters, such contrived plots, villains, murderers, fainting women. Do you not know that, Miss Marge? 
I, I've hurt you. I'm so sorry. Oh, uh, please don't pay any attention to me. It's just that everything happens at once. Everything? Uh, well, my little sister is ill, and my trip to Europe will never be. And Laurie. Laurie? Oh, right, your friend. He was in New York. He didn't even try to see me. What a fool he must be. And I chose this moment to criticize your writing. Oh, no, no. I always knew my stories weren't very good, but you see, they they help at home to pay the bills. Yes, yes, that is what I thought. And I say to myself, maybe I have no right to speak to her, for she does have the talent. Have I really? Great talent, my friend. And I say to you, sweep first the mud in the street before you are forced to that talent. Say to yourself, I will never write a single line which I have not, not first felt in my own heart. Say to yourself that while I am young, I will write the beautiful, simple things that I know and understand. Will you do that, Josephine? I'll try. I have a rich friend. He's a publisher. When you are ready for it, I will see that he reads what you write. Thank you. Only, I'm going back to Concord. I'm going home. Going home? It's where I belong. Then I... I will not see you again. Yes, go back home and write your stories. And maybe someday I will see you there, in your home. Well, Joe, having you home does bring a little light to the house again. It's been nothing but doctor's visits and worrying about your... You're worrying your mother and father. No, don't you go tiring your little sister. And, and you call for me when the tea gets cold. You know she can't. Well, she oughtn't. Thank you, Hannah. No, let me tend to our little princess in there. Don't cry, Joe. I don't want you to cry for me. I'm not crying for you, Beth, darling. I'm, I'm just lonesome for Amy and Meg in our old happy times. I'll be all right. It's no use, Joe. I know what the doctor must have said. Please, don't tell Marmy your father, but I know. Joe, you mustn't be afraid. Doesn't that sound funny, me saying that to you, when you have always said it to me? You have always reminded me of a seagull, Joe, strong and wild, fond of the wind and storm, and dreaming of flying out to sea. And Marmy said I was the cricket on the heart, content to stay at home. I can't express it very well. I guess I shouldn't even try, except to my Joe. But it seems I was never intended to live very long. I never planned what I would do when I grew up like the rest of you did, because, well, I could never bear the thought of leaving home. But I'm not afraid anymore, Joe. I've learned that I won't lose you, that nothing can really part us, though it seems to, and that we will always be a family, even though one of us is gone. But Joe, I think I will be homesick for you, even in heaven. In April, when Meg's baby was born, she named her Elizabeth in memory of their beloved sister. For a long time, no one saw very much of Jill. She shut herself up in the garret, writing and writing. Until one day, she paid Meg a visit. Joe! Darling, it's so nice to see you. What brings you here? It's all finished, Meg. My novel. I'm on the way to the post office now. Oh, how wonderful. Can I read it? When it comes back. Maybe it won't come back. Maybe they'll publish it. I'm not sending it to a publisher. It's going to Professor Bear. Oh. You... You write him often, don't you? Yes, I do. And he knows what I'm writing about. I mean, he understands me, Meg. Well, I think it's splendid. We, we had a letter, Joe, from, from Laurie. Oh? Joe, how would you feel if, if you heard that Laurie was learning to care for somebody else? Amy. Yes. They're all in Paris now. Then I wouldn't mind at all, Meg. How could I? Well, it's just that... That you seem so alone, Joe. I, well, I thought that if Laurie came back again... No, 
No. Amy and Lori. I'm truly glad, Meg. Truly glad. June brought Amy and Lori back to Concord as husband and wife. Joe, Joe, you busy? Uh, may I come in? Lori! Oh, Lori! When did you get back? Where's Amy? Downstairs, with the family. We and a thunderstorm just arrived. Oh, I can't wait to see her. Joe, Joe dear, I want to say one thing, and then we'll put it by forever. You don't need to say it, Lori. It was always meant to be this way. Then it can be like old times? No, I think those times are gone. But we can be family, always. Now let's go down. I want to kiss the bride. It was a wonderfully happy reunion that day, as the rain poured outside. Meg and John and their little ones came to welcome their sister home. Even Aunt March was reasonably cheerful. But none could overlook the silence of the piano, its little bench a reminder of how much they had lost. During the party, Lori heard someone at the front door. Oh. Uh, I beg your pardon, is Miss Marchin? <laughs> Miss Josephine March. Right, yes. Uh, won't you come in? Uh, oh, but but there are guests. Well, yeah, but, but, but I would go. Uh, if you will just give her this, please? Why, yes. Yes, of course. Thank you. This is for you, Joe. Oh, why, thank you, Laurie. Oh, it isn't for me. Some man just... Well, open it up, Joe. Don't just look at it. Why? Why, it's a book. Yes. Yes, Mermy. My Beth by Josephine March. Joe! Joe, it's your book. It's been published. Well, why didn't you tell us? Uh, who left it, Lori? Well, a man with a sort of accent. Well, where is he? He wouldn't come in. He went away. Oh, no. He couldn't. Oh, he couldn't have. Joe, come back. It's raining outside. <laughs> Professor! Professor Bear! Miss... Miss March? Josephine? Where are you going? Back to the railroad station. I came to bring you your book. My friend published it. You see, he has great hopes. He thinks it... Oh, never mind what he thinks. Did you like it? It has such truth. Such simple beauty. I cannot tell you why it stirred deep in my heart. And you were going away. I might never have seen you again. Oh, please come back. I couldn't intrude. You have guests. Oh no, it's just my family. My sister's come home, Amy. She's married to that man I told you about. Lori? Yes. Oh. And, oh, it's the first time we've all been together in such a long time. You will come back? Yo, I... Professor Bear, you told me to write what I knew, what I understood, in my own heart, and I did. And you've brought it to me now, bound and printed. And you are going to leave? These pages are my simple, beautiful things. And I don't want you just to read it. I want you to feel it. Please come in. Let me show you. draw the curtain on our production of Little Women. Yes, Jane, and though our show is finished, the March sisters will live on in our hearts. Please give one more round of applause for our amazing cast. And remember, don't wonder what's for dinner tonight. KB Quick Bites has got you covered. Thank you, and good night. Mm -hmm.